Uh, all right. Got a bulletin? Okay, if you've got a bulletin, you got notes on the back, all right? Just want you to take that out for a quick moment, all right? And if you got a Bible with you, I just want you to, I just want you to stick it in your Bible for just a moment, okay? Because this is for part two of today's sermon. Part two, all right? Part one, then part two. We'll go through this pretty quickly, but part one is coming first, all right? Are you ready for part one? Nobody's ready for part one. All right. Three people faking being ready for part one. <laughs> okay, where are my singing competition fans? All right. So uh, American Idol, you know, I might be a bit of an older reference. It's still on, right? Is American Idol still on? Um, one of the ones that's interesting to me, though, is uh, The Voice, right? Anybody watch The Voice here? Seen that? Okay, so you kind of know how The Voice works. It's an interesting one because uh, it's made up of teams, right? And there's celebrity coaches. Uh, but before they get to that portion, there is what they call the blind audition round. You guys know what this is all about? The blind audition round is where the four celebrity vocal coaches, right? Big names in music. Um, I forget who all is there. Blake Shelton, I think. Um, you know, Gwen Stefani, Kelly Clarkson, Clarkson, there you go. What they do is they begin uh, with their chairs uh, turned around so that they can't see who is singing, right? This is very interesting to me because it's like it's the vocal competition made for somebody like me because it's not dependent on what I look like. It's like I look at something like this, man, I got a shot. Right? And so this is, the purpose is that they're only listening to uh, the person's voice. And so the person begins to sing. Right? And as they're singing, uh, if they want to choose this vocalist to be on their team for the rest of the season, um, they will uh, hit a button in front of them. uh, and, And their chair will turn around so that they can actually see who it is that's singing. And then a sign will light up right underneath their chair that says in big white letters, uh, I want you, right? I think a lot of us sitting in this room today are doing life like it's an audition. And you're out there and you're living and you're working and you're working hard and you're doing what you're doing and really what's happening is you're waiting for somebody to hit a button and turn their chair around and choose you. I got to get good enough grades. I got to get, I got to get, uh, I got to be a good enough mom or a good enough dad or, or work hard enough or accumulate enough stuff or uh, make sure the retirement account is as big as it's going to get. You know, whatever that is, um, sitting here waiting for, and here's what it really is, uh, waiting for God in his throne in heaven to uh, finally hit a button and have his chair turn around and he points and he chooses me. I finally got it. I'm finally enough. I'm finally there. I think a lot of us do life that way. I think a lot of us are doing life like it's an audition. I'm trying out. I'm trying out for the love of God. So I'm behaving as hard as I can. I'm reading as much Bible as I possibly can. Uh, I'm going to church as often as I can, even in a pandemic. I'm doing all of these things, and and really, at the end of the day, what it's about is I'm waiting for God to hit a button and have his chair turn around and say, I want you. Bible's got something to say about this. I turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 for a moment. So before we get to the Colossians passage, Jeremiah chapter 1. Okay, Jeremiah was a prophet uh, called by God, sent by God to the people of Israel uh, to let them know, hey, uh, you, need to, you need to do some things differently. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a call from God before in your life, um, but 
Jeremiah's came relatively early. Okay? I uh, just want to read verse 5, Jeremiah 1 5. It'll be up on the screen for you as well. God says this to Jeremiah Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, I chose you. Okay? Do you see why it doesn't make any sense to do life like an audition? Right? You've given your life to Jesus Christ. You've been chosen. It's already happened. It's done. You have been chosen by God, and it was before you could practice your song. It was before you could uh, get it together. It was before you could uh, get it all together in your life and do well enough and, 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 and you know, behave well enough and, and, and be a good enough parent and, and be a good enough employee and, and, and hit all the marks. It was before any of that was ever possible, right? Because we believe in the sovereignty of God. Before you were born, he knew you, knew you, all the good, bad, and the ugly, knew you, and before you were born, he chose you. You know that? You're sitting in this room today. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he has chosen you. If you're sitting in this room today and you haven't yet given your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, um, he's calling you uh, because he's already tapping you on the shoulder. Before you get anything together, before any of that stuff happens, um, I chose you. This mentality changes everything. This mentality changes everything, okay? If I'm living my life like no one has chosen me and I'm waiting to be chosen, um, it's going to look a certain way. First off, you're going to be very exhausted and you're going to be filled with anxiety all the time, right? Just imagine if it was actually like you, you actually feel in a tryout. Anybody done a tryout before, right? The way you actually feel in a tryout, that's how life feels if you're living life like that. And that results in things that Man, they're just so incredibly unhealthy and it can result in sin. And, but if you, if you live with a different mentality, with this one, um, before you were born, before you even knew how to speak, before you could walk, I picked you to be with me, to be in my family, to do what I've called you to do. I picked you. This mentality changes everything. I want you to say it, okay? Just three words. God chose me. Say it. Say it again. God chose me. Okay. Um, how we say this is very important, though. How we say this is very important because I could say it like this. Well, God chose me. Of course he did. I'm awesome. I'm playing a part here. You know, like half the room over here is like, Psh. there's two authors. I've, uh, I've used this in a communion sermon before, but I haven't used it on Sunday morning, so I can recycle it one more time, okay? Um, there's two authors, Bob Shogren and Gerald Robeson. Uh, they wrote a book called Cat and Dog Theology, right? I just want to, those of you who remember this from me, I want to do a little review of it. Um, but they wrote this book, and uh, their whole premise is uh, we have to, if before anything else changes, before my behavior changes, before my uh, mood changes, before my life changes, I have to change how I approach God, all right? The mentality, the attitude with which I think of God. Um, 
yeah, who are my dog people out there? Dog people? Yeah. Um, if you have a dog, and just imagine this is like dog theology, okay? It's dog theology. Uh, how they think of you. Uh, well, they, uh, uh, he feeds me, uh, he pets me, uh, he shelters me, and uh, he cares for me. He must be God. So when you come home, who's out of their mind ready to see you? <laughs> Cats don't think like that. From the mind of a cat, uh, he feeds me, uh, he pets me, uh, he cares for me, he shelters me. I must be God. <laughs> this is what they say in the book. Uh, there's too much cat theology in the church, right? Because I could say a phrase like this, God chose me, and I could say it as if it makes sense to me. Well, yeah, God chose me. Well, yeah, God chose me. Of course he did. I go to church every week. I read my Bible. I, I, I'm, I'm a good citizen. I'm all of those things. Of course God would choose me. Um, and then we have, even, we have teachers that lean into this as if when I read the Bible, it's mostly there to tell me things about me, like, uh, hey, you are brave, and you are amazing, and, and, and you are awesome. Well, no wonder when I say a word, when I say a phrase like God chose me, um, I'm like, yeah, Bible says I'm great, except the Bible was written to tell me things about God more than it was written to tell me things about me. It tells me things about me, but it also says things like, um, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Skip over those, right? God chose me. And the way that I say this is filled with uh, wa is wa, <laughs> awe and wonder. There we go, wa. You can write that down in your book of Pastor Steve screwed up, and in ten years bring it back. You know, filled with wa. When I say God chose me, it should fill me up with wonder. It shouldn't make any sense to me. God, before I was born, God picked me, me. He knew me. He knew me and he picked me. How, how, how does that make any sense at all? I am blown away by the reality that the God of the universe, who is holy and majestic and almighty, would point to me and say, hey, I want you in the family. And I'm going to make a way to make that happen. That mentality is the attitude of the chosen. Right? Okay. Here we go. Sermon part two. Let's go to Colossians chapter three. Pull your notes out. Colossians chapter three. This is this chapter that we began last week in a new series. We're in new year, new attitude, right? We said this about attitudes, and attitude is not a mood, right? Bad moods can come from bad attitudes, for sure, but an attitude is not a mood. An attitude is an intentional pattern of thinking sustained over a long period of time. That's an attitude. So I have an attitude toward my Spouse, I've got an attitude toward my work, toward my church, toward the government, toward politics, toward the Detroit Lions. I've got attitudes about all kinds of things, and it's not a mood. A bad mood can come from a bad attitude, but it is a sustained, intentional pattern of thinking. And this is why God says, uh, Philippians 2, um, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. I can choose it. I choose my attitude. I choose my pattern of thinking. And God says, because you are renewed in Christ, it's time to choose better attitudes, better patterns of thinking. And so that's what we began with in verses 1 through 11 in chapter 3. And today, the rest of the sermon, we're just going to focus on one verse, verse 12. Okay? It's going to focus on one verse, verse 12, Colossians 3, verse 12. 
Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's an interesting statement right there, okay? Because we begin with this reality that I just described for you uh, as God's, what's the word? Chosen people, okay? So Paul is saying, here, don't miss this, um, you have been chosen and because you've been chosen by God, uh, undeserving, you did not deserve it, you did not earn it, you did not do anything to make it happen to initiate it, it was God's decision, God's move to choose you. Because of that, there are implications. And if you maintain the mentality, the attitude of the chosen, that I am somebody who was chosen by God, independent of my behavior, independent of the things that I could have done to earn it, I didn't do anything to earn it, if I think like that, here's the implication. Look at the list of things that he says there. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What are the things that those have in common? What's the one thing that all of those have in common? Uh, it has to do with how I treat other people. Okay, number one, main idea. God wants us to treat each other as he treats us, okay? God wants us to treat each other uh, as he has treated us. He says this a lot of different ways in scripture, and so it is clear <laughs> that the attitude of the chosen has to do with not just how I see myself as someone who's chosen, but how I see everybody else as those who are loved by God, and I treat them accordingly. Uh, and so uh, look at this word chosen here for a moment. Therefore, as God's chosen people, I want you to think about the letter that this is found. It's Colossians, right? These are letters, New Testament letters written to New Testament churches that the apostle Paul uh, began in this day and age, first century uh, AD Christianity. And so he's writing to the church in Colossae. And there's something you need to know about the makeup of this church. It's not just Jewish people. There are Jewish people there, but it is a whole lot of, you know the word? No. Gentiles. So, don't miss how radical of a statement this is when Paul says, as God's chosen people. Right? I want to take you back to Deuteronomy for a moment. Uh, just be prepared for a tour of Scripture today, all right? Lots of different verses. I'm going to have them on the screen for you. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 6. Uh, this is a statement that God makes uh, to the Israelites, this is what he says to them, for you are a people, listen to the similarity of the language, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has, read that word, chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his, I love this, his treasured possession. Okay, so if you are somebody who is uh, Israelite heritage, descendant of Abraham, you're thinking, oh yeah, God chose us. Clearly he chose us and he chose us out of everybody else. But now God is saying through the apostle Paul, um, I'm cho my choosing is going worldwide. This is not just for the Israelites anymore. This is, I am choosing people for myself from among the Gentiles as well. And if the good news is for everybody, that should change how I treat everybody. So Paul says, attitude of the chosen, as chosen, uh, do this. Number two, we accept this reality. Our attitude toward people reveals our attitude toward God. Our attitude toward people reveals our attitude toward God. Um, if I am somebody who really, the way that I live, even though I might not say it directly, the way that I live uh, says, well, yeah, God chose me, man. <laughs> That's going to show itself in how I treat people. True? I'm really probably going to more so 
use people uh, more than anything else because uh, man, God, God chose me. I'm awesome. So I'm going to hang out with all the awesome people, and I'm not going to hang out with the unawesome people. And uh, that's how I'm going to live my life. And uh, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll talk to an unawesome person uh, here and there uh, if it benefits me. But, you know, outside of that, this is what I'm going to do. It's how I'm going to live my life. You see how my attitude, right, toward God, God chose me, of course, uh, reflects my attitude toward uh, people. But if my attitude is, man, God chose me, God chose me. It makes no sense to me why he chose me and, and made it possible for me to come to faith and, and to be saved and to have the life that I have. So um, how's that person going to treat people? Uh, very, very differently. Okay, here we go. Let's look at the attitude of the chosen in detail as we break down this verse. I told you the rest of the sermon is just on this one verse, Colossians 3.12. Um, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love... Uh, clothe yourselves with, and here's the first word, compassion. And so number 3A in your notes is this. I show compassion to the hurting because God shows compassion to me. I show compassion to the hurting because God shows compassion to me. First off, notice the language he uses there, clothe yourselves with. Uh, It's your choice Right? We choose this attitude, and it's an attitude of compassion. It's how I think, right? Uh, clothe yourselves with compassion. Um, all right, listen up. How many of you have uh, purchased a new pair of jeans before? Okay. Uh, for how many of you, when you put brand new pair of jeans on, you're like, perfect fit. This is amazing. Uh, not my experience. Generally, I think, man, I put my new pair of jeans on. I'm like, <laughs> and then I get home. I'm like, I put my old jeans on. <laughs> Why? Because my old jeans are worn around my body. <laughs> I've worked hard for these curves. <laughs> Clothe yourselves with compassion. Uh, this is new. This is brand new, so I'm just letting you know it's probably not going to be comfortable at first. Right? Every single day you have the choice. Every day you have the choice. Am I going to clothe myself with the new attitude from God or am I going to clothe myself with the old attitudes from my previous dead self? And here's the thing. Your old attitudes are comfortable. Your old attitudes toward people are comfortable. Right? So uh, we look at compassion. Uh, What's the opposite of compassion? Uh, I would say the opposite of compassion is apathy. Okay? Uh, I don't don't care. I don't care that much. I might be moved a little bit, but I don't care that much. And and that's the old attitude. And apathy is, it's comfortable, man. It's comfortable. Why? Because I see something on the TV screen or I hear something at church about somebody who's hurting and uh, it's like, man, that's crazy. And uh, then I go home and, and uh, I'm going to watch some Netflix and chill out and make myself some food and, and just kind of do the day that way. Why? Because my old attitude of apathy is very comfortable, right? And you're going to see this all throughout this list of, of this attitude of the chosen Uh, says, no, I reject apathy. Uh, I am clothing myself with compassion. Uh, Compassion is not um, to feel bad for. That's not what compassion is. That's sympathy, okay? Uh, When I feel bad for someone who's hurting, that's sympathy. That's not compassion. Compassion is an action. I do something. This is what it is to take compassion or to have compassion on somebody else is to take action to relieve someone's pain. That is when I have compassion. When I look at somebody who's hurting um, and I think, man, I feel really bad for them. 
okay, let's go get some food. That's not compassion. Might be sympathy, but that's not compassion. And the attitude of the chosen, God chose me. He picked me out of nowhere. I don't deserve to have what I have. The attitude of the chosen is, um, man, this person's hurting. Uh, what can I do? What can I do? I might not be able to do everything that somebody else can do, but there's something I can do to help relieve the pain. Uh, maybe it's just, I'm going to write him a note. Maybe I'm just going to give him a call, or I'm just going to go ask how things are going, and I'm going to just be there with them. Whatever it is, the attitude of the chosen is, I'm clothing myself with compassion, so when I see somebody who's hurting, I do something about it. Jesus did this, and he demonstrated it. Matthew 14, 14. Uh, I'm going to throw this up there on the screen for you. Uh, Matthew 14, 14. Do we get that one in there, Joel? In Matthew 14, Jesus is about to feed the group of 5,000, and he sa this says this. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and what did he do? Healed their sick. It doesn't say he had compassion on them and felt bad. He thought, man, I hope things get better. No, he did something about it, and that's the attitude that God is calling us to. Clothe yourselves with compassion. Uh, next one on the list is kindness. The attitude of the chosen. See someone who's hurting, I have compassion. And now I'm somebody who is demonstrating a consistent kindness. Uh, this is B in your notes. Uh, I am kind to everyone because God is always kind to me. I am kind to everyone because Jesus is always kind to me. Um, I would talk about the opposite of kindness as coldness. Um, coldness is comfortable. Kindness is uncomfortable. And you think, well, how could kindness be uncomfortable? I, it's just being kind to people. And, and you're right. It is kind of, uh, it's kind of the low-hanging fruit of the Christian life a little bit. Like, you just be kind. Like, <laughs> just, how do I live for Jesus? Okay, start here. Just be kind to people. Start there, okay? That, that, that's good. It's good to start there. Um, but here's what I mean about it. It's uncomfortable because um, the kindness is not limited uh, to the people that I like to be kind to. I need to be kind to everyone. So therefore, I need to be kind to people who cut me off in traffic. Anybody else here give like the sarcastic thumbs up? <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm a Christian man, so I'm not allowed to make any other symbols and shouldn't do that. So I'm driving along and somebody cuts me off and, and maybe I happen to pass. Isn't that satisfying too? They like cut you off to get ahead of you and then you're both stopped at a stoplight. It's the same. It's like, ha, <laughs> You didn't go any faster. And so sometimes I like to turn them, give them the Steve Lister sarcastic thumbs up. That's not kind though. <laughs> The Lord knows it's not kind. I need to be kind. I need to be kind to the waiter or waitress who gets my order completely wrong. Really easy to do that if it's somebody you know. If it's somebody you don't know, it's very easy to be unkind. But if I'm if I'm going with the attitude of the chosen, this is how I think through life. I was chosen by God out of nowhere undeserved, unearned. Okay, I'm kind to everybody. So therefore, I'm going to go out of my way to um, be kind. Kind to those who disagree with me. Uh, kind to those who don't look like me or don't talk like me. I'm going to be kind to everybody that I come across, especially those that's hardest to show kindness to. I'm going to be kind to somebody who's rude to me. Right, so often we justify being rude when we receive rudeness first, and that is not the call of the Christian. That is not the attitude of the chosen. That's the old attitude. 
Man, you're cold toward me. I'm going to be cold toward you. Here you go. Have some of your own medicine. But what Jesus calls us to is, is kindness. To repay rudeness and coldness with kindness every single time. Kindness, kindness, kindness. And some people hear that and they think, well, that's a weak person. No, it's not. It's a strong person who's living for Jesus in every possible way. Kindness, kindness, kindness. The attitude of the chosen, right? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, right? I see a hurt. I do something about it with kindness, right? In all situations, even to those who I struggle to show kindness to, um, and now humility. The attitude of the chosen. So this is letter C in your notes. I concern myself with other people's interests before I even think of my own because that's how Jesus treats me. Okay? I concern myself with other people's interests before I even think of my own because that's how Jesus treats me me. I want to bring your attention to Philippians 2 verse 7. Philippians 2 7, if we've got it up there, Joel. Right, Just a few pages back in your Bible, actually, a couple pages back, where it says this, Jesus, though he uh, was equal with God, is God, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Um, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself completely. This is the example um, that Jesus sets. Um, and he actually, believe it or not, lives it out completely. Um, I want you to take a brief look at Matthew chapter 10. I don't think we have this one up on the screen, but Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 29. Okay. Um, this is what Jesus teaches us. And how the attitude of the chosen leads to um, humility, okay? Listen to this. Jesus is teaching about fear, and he says this beginning in verse 29 of Matthew 10. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. That's a number that's always changing, by the way, especially if you're me. It's always changing. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Okay. Go here with me. Humility is not um, thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. That's humility. I forget about myself so that I can be concerned with somebody else's interests and somebody else's preferences over and above my own because I'm just forgetting about myself. Here's what makes this possible. It's the attitude of the chosen. God's laser-focused attention on me makes it possible for me to pay attention to other people. <laughs> the hair's on my head, man. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows to God. So uh, you don't have to pay so much attention to you because somebody else is already paying better attention to you. God knows what's going on. He is looking at you. He is thinking of you all the time. If you were to stop thinking of you, you would cease to exist. This is how God shows you attention. So therefore, um, you're chosen and holy people set aside by God, focused on by God. So just think about other people now. Put other people's interests before your own because you already got the God of the universe who's concerned about your interests. And we don't believe this a lot. We believe that, well, God doesn't have my best interests at heart. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. All the time. In every situation. Well, well not every situation goes my way. No, it does not. Because God knows better what's best for me. True? He will work all things together for the good of those who love him. This is how it works. He's paying such close attention to you. You can say, you know what? I don't need to worry about my own preferences tonight in my home. Uh, we can watch whatever, we, whatever the family wants to watch. We can eat whatever the family wants to eat. We can do all those things. Uh, and, and I'm not... <laughs> right. The difference between um, like a servant in the family and like a doormat in the family is that a servant's happy about it. Well, I'm just letting... Should everybody watch it? No. 
I'm firm when I need to be, but when it comes to preferences, I lay them down. Why? I don't need to focus on me. God will take care of me. He's looking out for me. He knows all the numbers of the hair that are on my head. And this morning there were less. And he's got the update. I don't have to pay so much attention to me. I can be humble um, because I'm chosen. He's paying attention to me. Therefore, attitude of the chosen, God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. I do something about hurt, kindness to everybody, humility. Man, he's paying attention to me. I don't need to pay so much attention to me. I can look at other people. And here we go, gentleness. Gentleness. This is D in your notes. I am gentle and not harsh to everyone because that's how God treats me. Okay? I am gentle and not harsh. Uh, I want to speak particularly to the men in the room right now. Some of us, we hear the word gentle and we think weak. I think, well, that's a female trait, to be gentle. No, it's not. Gentleness is not weakness. I've got one picture that will prove this to you, okay? Joel, throw it up there. That's a male lion. It's got some teeth, right? Carrying one of his cubs in the same jaw that, you know, like crushes bones. Gentleness is controlled strength. The Bible says this about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 42 and prophecy about him. And it says this is the kind, of per- the kind of person that Jesus is going to be when he comes is how you will recognize him. All right, Isaiah 42 verse 3 says this a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out and faithfulness he will bring forth justice Um, a bruised reed he will not break right Uh, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out right have you ever tried to when you have like a match that's barely lit and it's going out, it's going out, it's going out, and you're kind of trying to move it to wherever the candle is. Have you ever tried to do this? Right? You breathe the wrong way and it's over. Jesus is so gentle. His strength is so controlled uh, that that flame will not go out. Right? And the bruised reed, how many of us are bruised reeds? Right? This is just humanity. It's just being human. Being human, broken, imperfect, and God, uh, in all his strength and all of his mightiness, um, does not crush us. Like a lion carrying his cub. And this is how he calls us to treat other people. Here's the question to ask. Here we go. How do I respond when someone lets me down? How do I respond when someone lets me down, when someone makes a mistake? In other words, how do I respond when someone is a human in front of me? Do I respond with harshness or do I respond with gentleness? How do I respond? How do I respond when somebody makes a mistake that affects me? Do I respond harshly or do I respond with controlled strength and gentleness designed to help rather than crush? How do I respond? the attitude of the chosen, I've been chosen by God, undeservedly so, uh, says, I am going to respond with gentleness. Uh, this is, I, I love how one of the commentaries I read said it like this way about Jesus and said, um, Jesus knows how to apply strength to vulnerability. Jesus knows exactly how to apply strength to vulnerability. And this is what he calls us to do the same way, to apply strength to vulnerability in a way that is gentle and does not crush. How do I respond when people fail me? 
Do I respond with gentleness and mercy and kindness? This is what God calls us to. I do if I'm maintaining the attitude of the chosen. All right, here's the last part. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is letter E. I will be as patient with others as God is with me. Simple. But tough. I will be as patient with others as God is with me. Um, when we read patience here, do not think um, good at waiting. That's not what this means. To be patient here with people doesn't mean I, I, I can wait for a long time. That's not what this is. Um, so the opposite here of patience uh, is wrath. The Apostle Paul, who wrote these words inspired by God, also wrote these other words uh, in a letter to a young pastor that we have in 1 Timothy, where he says this, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst but for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. His immense patience toward me. Uh, he should have snuffed me out. He should have taken me out with my great sin. And yet he did not do that. Why? Because he's patient. And so if I'm chosen by that God, I'm patient toward other people when they sin against me. This is more than just a mistake or a failure or an annoyance. When they sin against me, I am patient. Instead of doling out wrath, cutting them off, I do what God did for me. I say, I'm gonna be patient. I'm going to allow time for this to work out. I'm going to, I'm going to seek restoration and forgiveness. I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do to have reconciliation with this, with this person. Why? Because God was patient with me. He is patient with me. I messed up this morning. And he is incredibly patient with me. And that's how I do this. My friends, the attitude of the chosen is a game changer for how I treat other people. Do I believe, honestly, that God chose me and it had nothing to do with me? I have no idea why he did, but he did, and that's the reality that I live in, if that's the case. Um, as Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let it be evident in how we treat other people. It's a thought process. You have to choose it every day. God chose me. God chose me. <laughs> God chose me. And that's crazy. And ask God to help you change how you see and treat other people as a result. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reality of your word, what you have given us here, this new attitude. Help us, Lord, to maintain this attitude. You chose us. And so therefore... This is how we treat everybody that we see. Because it blows us away, Lord, that you picked us, but you did. Well, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, and mercy. Help us show that to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.